Hi, my name is Tori and I am a doctor of physical therapy who specializes in pelvic dysfunction, which means that part of what I do surrounds bowel dysfunction. So I work with humans that have things going wrong with their bowels. Think chronic constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, painful abdominal bloating, maybe hemorrhoids or anal fissures, fecal incontinence, which just means leaking poop, or the other end of the spectrum, like fecal urgency, you feel like you have to poop all the time, even rectocele, rectal prolapse, that sort of thing. It has been my experience as a healthcare provider that humans with bowel dysfunction tend to go through the ringer before they find some sort of relief and also understanding as to why something's going wrong with their bowels. I want there to be more easy to understand information available to the public about their bowels, what can go wrong, and hopefully how to make those things better. All of this to say, before I can deep dive into more specific bowel disorders, I need to talk about more global bowel health related topics like how to sit on the toilet properly to poop. So without further ado, let's dive into proper toilet positioning for defecation or how to sit on the toilet the right way to poop. And let's talk about why. So I've got six guidelines essentially that I want to outline for you. We'll outline those guidelines and then we'll dive into each one and specifically discuss why it's a guideline. Guideline number one is to position your knees higher than your hips. Guideline number two is to spread your legs a little bit more than hip width apart. Guideline number three is to lean forward, placing either your elbows or your forearms on your knees, but keeping your neck and spine nice and neutral, not letting them slouch forward. Guideline number four is to let your abdomen or your stomach relax. Guideline number five is to either use a certain kind of breath or a very gentle push to initiate your bowel movement instead of straining or holding your breath. I definitely don't want you straining and holding your breath. And the very last guideline, guideline number six, is that if you can't poop, if you tried but you failed, get up and move around. Wait until you have another urge to defecate. Don't sit on the toilet for more than five minutes maybe 10 minutes, depending on what's going on, but we'll talk more about that. So let's break down each of those guidelines. So guideline number one was to position your knees higher than your hips. Let's talk about why that's so important. The main reason that that's so important is because of something called your anorectal angle. So let's bring it back and recall that if we were gonna follow food through our GI system and we were starting in the lower half of our GI system, we've already eaten the food, it's already gone down our esophagus, it's already been in our stomach, it's already been in our small intestine, that second half of the GI system is gonna go large intestine into rectum into anus and then out into the world. That anorectal angle is quite literally the angle that your poop has to travel through your rectum into your anus before it goes out into the world. If your knees are lower than your hips, if you're sitting on a standard westernized toilet, like an American toilet, that angle is gonna be more acute. It's gonna look more like this Whereas if you have your knees higher than your hips, that angle is gonna be more obtuse. It's gonna be more of a straight line, which means that poop is gonna go straight down the chute instead of having to make a weird angled turn. So biomechanically speaking, this is the best position that you can get in. So some people will actually stand up on the toilet seat and squat. You can do this if you're confident that the toilet itself will not break and also that you will not slip. But I will say this is not how I defecate at home, but you could try it. It's definitely an option. Other people use squatty potties, which will definitely get your knees higher than your hips. You could also try high heels, as silly as that sounds. High heels will help get your knees higher than your hips. You could lay a trash can on its side and use that to get your knees higher than your hips. You could use textbooks, you could use a footstool, you could use a phone book if you still have one. The options are only limited by your imagination. Guideline number two was getting your legs a little bit more than hip width apart. This guideline is partly due to the fact that we are trying to create a squat-like position that is the best position for you to defecate in and you can't squat with your knees together. When you squat, your knees have to come apart. But part of this also has to do with us trying to get the pelvic floor to relax. Think about your pelvic floor living right in between your two sit bones here. When your knees are together, 
that pelvic floor is pushed together. It's in a more shortened state. When your knees are apart, that pelvic floor is more stretched, elongated. It makes it a little bit easier for that pelvic floor to relax. If your pelvic floor acts like a sphincter around your rectum, you want that pelvic floor nice and relaxed when you're defecating. One thing I will say about this guideline is, depending on what kind of pants you're wearing, it might entail that you should pull your pants down, potentially all the way down to your ankles. If you're wearing more restricting fabric, you might not be able to spread your legs far apart because of a denim restriction, for example. Whereas if you're wearing something like leggings, it might be a lot easier to spread your legs apart without pulling your pants down all the way. That third and final guideline that surrounds true positioning has to do with making sure that you are leaning forward, either resting your elbows or your forearms on your knees. I ideally keeping your neck and spine neutral instead of a slouch. Why is this guideline important? Again, we are trying to create that squat-like position. So the combination of getting your knees higher than your hips, getting your legs a little bit wider than hip width apart, and then gently leaning forward creates a more optimal squat. It also helps with that anorectal angle. It helps that anorectal angle be more obtuse or more like a straight line instead of more acute. It also helps a very specific pelvic floor muscle relax. That pelvic floor muscle is called your puborectalis. I'm gonna do my best to explain what puborectalis does. I'm also going to use my incredible fiance as a model with me, and we are going to try to show you puborectalis and why it's so important that puborectalis relaxes. So you can imagine puborectalis kind of like a slingshot. So with this imagery, we're imagining that puborectalis kind of slings around like this. We're imagining that the front here, where puborectalis attaches, is behind the pubic bones. And then we're imagining here, in this space, where you might put something to actually sling, that's wrapped around your bowel. Specifically, right where your anus and your rectum meet, but wrapped around your bowel. So, if we're here, and you can imagine that muscle is more contracted, well then it's pulling the bowel that lives here into a more acute angle. Whereas if that muscle is long and relaxed, then again, we've got more of that straight line connecting rectum to anus. But I am gonna show you with Keith what this looks like. So let's pause and we'll jump to that clip. Okay, so we're gonna use Keith in this example. So we are gonna imagine that from the hips up, this is rectum, and then from the hips down, this is anus, and I'm gonna be that puborectalis slingshot-like muscle. So, if I am wrapped around Keith right where rectum and anus meet, and then this back part of me, I'm attached to right behind the pubic bone, when I am shortened or contracted, there's more of an angle. The rectum and anus create more of an acute angle. That's that anorectal angle that we were talking about versus when I relax and elongate, then there's almost a straight line between rectum and anus. The fourth guideline was to let your stomach relax. So let's break down why that's important. Reason number one why that's important is because your abdomen and your pelvic floor are synergists. Synergist is just a fancy term that means if one muscle is turned on, it's hard for the other muscle to fully relax and vice versa. So when your abdomen is turned on, it's difficult for your pelvic floor to relax, which means it's difficult for your puborectalis to relax, which we know is important from our previous discussion. So if you get into the position that we've been describing, if you get into that squat-like position, so we can mimic this position together on the ground right now, if you come down into a squat and you imagine first making sure that your knees are higher than your hips, then you're making sure that your knees are a little bit more than hip width apart, and here we are kind of leaning forward, resting on our forearms or our elbows, resting here, and you check in with your stomach, you might notice that it's tucked. So mine right now, I can feel it, it's tucked. This is totally normal, it's a postural muscle, so you might have to make the conscious decision to just relax the stomach. Could you see how much my stomach changed there? It went from being tucked, more like this, naturally, this is just how it is when I get down here, to just like letting it pooch, hang, 
loose, if you will. I'm not talking forcefully pushing your stomach out. I just mean check in with it, see if it's naturally tucking itself in, and if it is, let it go. Let it naturally pooch, if you will. That'll help pelvic floor relax and that will help you have an easier bowel movement. That fifth guideline that we talked about is either using your breath or a gentle push to initiate a bowel movement instead of straining or holding your breath to initiate a bowel movement. Let's break that down together a little bit as well. Whether or not you need to push to initiate a bowel movement has everything to do with how long you waited since you had the urge, did you delay the urge, or are you acting on the urge to defecate right away, and how strong is that urge to defecate? We've all had those little baby urges where we're like, eh, I could poop or I could not poop, versus those urges where you're like, I need to get to the bathroom right away. Compare those two experiences. When you have that small, eh, I could poop urge, and you go to the bathroom, chances are high that you're gonna have to push to initiate. If you have that super strong urge that I need to get to the bathroom right away to poop urge, you don't have to do much. You sit down on the toilet and boom, you start pooping. The same thing is true for whether or not you delayed the urge to defecate. Did you go the second that you felt the urge or did you wait 30, 40 minutes? The longer you wait, the more of a push you're gonna need to initiate that bowel movement. Now, if you had a strong urge and you're acting on it soon, ideally you'd be able to use your breath to initiate your bowel movement. Specifically, you would be using a diaphragmatic breath. So imagine this with me. Your diaphragm lives here. And every time you inhale, your lungs expand with air and your diaphragm has to move down to accommodate for the change in volume of the lungs. So every time you inhale, your diaphragm moves down, you have an increase in intra-abdominal pressure, and your pelvic floor, which lives in between your sit bones, also has to move down with the inhale. Whereas when you exhale, and your diaphragm gets to move back up because your lungs no longer have as much volume because air has left the lungs, so you exhale, your diaphragm moves up, you have a decrease in intra-abdominal pressure, your pelvic floor also moves up. So you can directly affect the length of your pelvic floor with your breathing. But I do think it's a little bit counterintuitive because I think most of the time we think exhale, relax, but with pelvic floor, it's on the inhale because you inhale, your lungs expand, your diaphragm moves down, you have an increase in intra-abdominal pressure, and your pelvic floor also elongates or lengthens or moves down or relaxes or you have pelvic floor excursion whatever you want to call it it's the same thing so with that in mind we can use our breath to help pelvic floor relax to help puborectalis relax to help that anorectal angle to help initiate a bowel movement without a push if we have that really strong urge and we're defecating right away ideally we'd be using that diaphragmatic breath so what does that mean Usually when we breathe, if you place a hand on your chest and a hand on your belly, we like to breathe into our chest and it ends up looking something like this. The question is, can you breathe and only move this hand and keep this hand still? So if you think about a belly big, belly hard inhale, Let's see that from a different angle. Here's that side angle. Here's a chest breath. Instead of a belly breath, which looks more like. If you can connect with that belly big, belly hard inhale and really breathe into your abdomen instead of into your chest, you can promote that pelvic floor relaxation, you can get that puborectalis to relax, and you can essentially initiate a bowel movement with your breath. Now, if you had a small urge to defecate or you had an urge but you delayed that urge, let's say you waited 30, 40 minutes to use the restroom, well then you might actually need a gentle push. But ideally, you would use that gentle push without the inhale, hold your breath and forcefully push. That's straining and that's something that we do not want you to be doing. So if you think about that same breathing technique, it ends up looking something like you inhale belly big, belly hard. And at the end of that inhale, you're adding just a gentle push with that abdomen, but you can still speak, exhale, breathe, all of it. And then 
effortless exhale. So again, we're here, we're breathing into our bellies, belly big, belly hard, inhale. Adding a gentle push at the very end, effortless exhale. Finally, and what's really important, is that if you try to defecate, you try to poop, but you can't poop, that you get up, move around, and wait for that urge to return instead of sitting on the toilet and straining and trying to force a bowel movement. If you're having a hard time initiating a bowel movement, ask yourself a couple of questions. Question number one is, am I going to the bathroom right now because I actually have an urge to defecate or am I doing this out of convenience? Am I going to the bathroom because I want the privacy? Am I going to the bathroom right now because I want 30 minutes to go at home instead of five minutes to go at work? If you're not acting on a true urge to defecate, it's gonna be difficult to initiate a bowel movement. The other question is, did you empty your bowels when you had a strong urge to defecate or are you emptying your bowels with a more indifferent urge? If you are acting on those small, minor, kind of indifferent urges to defecate, it's gonna be difficult to initiate the bowel movement and it might force you to be more forceful and strained. The longer you can delay the decision, the stronger the urge will be, the more natural pressure will build in that lower GI system, and the easier it will be to initiate a bowel movement. Try not to force it. As far as taking no longer than five minutes to have a bowel movement, in an ideal world, if we didn't have any distractions like our phones or things of that nature with us in the bathroom, a healthy bowel movement should only take a couple of minutes to initiate, defecate, and then feel like you had a complete bowel movement, get up, walk away, and go on with your day. When I'm working with someone one-on-one -on -one that has some sort of bowel disorder, we might elongate that time if it's indicated, like maybe we start with no more than 15 minutes and then slowly work our way down to something more along the lines of three to five minutes but that is variable depending on what's going on. So when I get into more specific bowel dysfunction videos, I'll try to be more specific in my guidelines, but know that someone with optimal functioning, healthy bowels who didn't have a distraction like a phone or something else in the bathroom with them should be able to initiate the bowel movement, have the bowel movement feel complete and walk away in like five minutes even if that may be less. Whew. Thank you so much for watching. Please feel free to comment any questions or if you have any video suggestions, things that you would like to see, topics you'd like me to discuss, either surrounding pelvises more globally or specifically surrounding bowel dysfunction, let me know. I would love to create content that you are looking for. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you guys next time. Bye.